In today's video, we're gonna go check out some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. Gen Z, watch out. This Gen Z just broke down crying and issued an entire warning to a generation. What she said caused international headlines. Quick backstory, she lives in Manhattan and after graduation, she got her first full-time job. One day when she got home from work, she issued a video that went absolutely wild and caused a generational divide. She said, I'm commuting and it takes me effing forever to get there. There's no way I'm gonna be able to afford to live in the city right now. She went on to say something that even sparked more debate. I get on the train at 7.30 a.m. and I don't get home till 6.15 at the earliest. I don't have time to do anything. I wanna shower, eat, go to sleep. I don't have time and energy to cook dinner. I don't have energy to work out. I'm super upset right now. It's caused a cultural divide with this Fox News anchor and self-identified Gen Z coming out to say, that this is how the real world works. Success isn't handed to you. Begs a huge question. Is Gen Z lazy at work or are they simply better at setting healthy boundaries? If you think Gen Z, there's no work for you, that might be because 75% of managers or business leaders say Gen Z are hard and more difficult to work with than other generations. 49% of these decision makers say Gen Z lack communication skills, effort, motivation, and even technological skills. I don't know. I don't necessarily think that Gen Z are harder to work with. I do think that they are more entitled to their thoughts and opinions and they just want a boundary respect. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have to understand work laws and how to, to work, you know, because you definitely have to work if you want to live a life of luxury. You got to work to get to that luxury, you know? And I'm just, I'm reading some of the comments through this video. And like, if you look, this individual says, Gen Z here, we're not going to be able to retire. We can't afford to start families. We at least deserve a life outside of work. How are you going to get a life outside of work if you're not working to be able to live a lifestyle, you know? And that's just like the mentality that a lot of Gen Z has. And if you keep with that mentality, you need to at least figure out how to make money outside of work, if you will. What do you guys think about this? Do you think that Gen Z is on the right path of not wanting to work as much because there's opportunities outside of the quote unquote workstation? Or do you think that maybe they should just get it together and do their job and earn their way to success, like most people have to. Mary of Congress archives. When we look at this circa 1900 picture of the Murray Hill Hotel in New York. Now, I'm just gonna leave it zoomed out for a second. At first glance, there's nothing too suspicious. I mean, that is a strange fog over the top of the building. It doesn't really look like natural exposure. And we can also see that the sky is visible. So how can that be so? Is this a sky swapped image? Well, let's zoom in closer because this photo is very weird. Well, for starters, the entire bottom and right side of this image is painted. Yet we know that the base is a photograph. Look at this, it's just really strange because this is labeled as a dry plate negative. It's not mentioned as a photo montage or doctored image, but why not? 15% of this image was painted in to look realistic to be invisible, the true art of retouching. In the sky, there's paint on the clouds, and you can even see etching marks left over from this process. You can see that the streets were painted over. This car was painted over for some reason. The street light is completely painted in. And don't say, oh, it's because some things just didn't come into detail. No, this is another level of paint over. There are random people painted in in a variety of different places, some poorly drawn, but from a distance, you would never notice. Painted over faces in random areas. This entire portion of the stairs is painted in. So they would paint on historic photos? Not just paint, but to make it realistic from a distance. It's weird because to the right of this image, there's a section that's not painted. And you can see it looks like a building. So were they trying to paint that out? In Australia, there's a collection of photographs known as the Tarot Collection in the Powerhouse Museum. They never say anything about altered photographs or manipulation. But in this photo, called Carrying Wool, and it's in Sydney, well, we see what looks like at the top gray paint with white writing and an overexposed white sky. But this isn't just overexposure of light due to the blues picking up brighter, but instead, it is a clear cutout. Now at first that doesn't seem like a big deal, but let's look up closer. You can see that they masked around these men and behind them is the original sky color and exposure. And as you get over to the wool, 
you can actually see that they cut up to 15 men out of the photo. You can see their legs once you zoom in. Truth is, many of these photos have unknown artists and no one knows the reason why they would even do this. In the Library of Congress, there's a photo of Narragansett Pier, Rhode Island, and it seems that this is very similar. The gray is the original sky, but for some reason, they're coming in and adding in white? There's no explanation in the description other than these are dry plate negatives. You can see this in multiple photos of this collection. From the Library of Congress, Shelton Square, Buffalo. Let's take a look at this from a glance. What do you think? If this was framed in a museum, I wouldn't really notice anything. But let's look closer. The first and most obvious alteration is that the image has been painted on. Streets were completely painted over. Figures and people drawn in. Now some may say, oh well, they're just cleaning up exposure ghosting. But it's actually more than that. You can even see that they had an understanding on how to paint shadows. Remember what we learned from the photography self-manual. This was an artistic process with handling these negatives and with a knife they could alter and manipulate the image to fit the vision. I say that because if I was to tell you that these people could be added in without stating anything that we said before, most people would be like, you are crazy. But why? This person's looking straight at the ground. This guy has his hands behind his back. They had the science and art down to combine photos and add shadows in. More people equals a more pleasing photograph. If they had hundreds of stock photos of skies, who's to say that they don't have the same for all sorts of categories? including people standing and looking at nothing, then using the etching process or even paint to just finalize the photo. Most people would not be able to notice because they have no clue of the process in general. As the guy in the Vox video says, who's going to grab a magnifying glass and look at these things? You could even combine negatives of badly taken photographs to give the impression of bad exposure. Which would explain why sometimes in these old photographs, you see a combination of very sharp people and then very blurry people, and some of them are not moving. It's not just because of the speed. It seems that they may have been combining multiple negatives with different resolutions. They even painted over this horse, and even some of the perspectives of these carts look off. There are actually multiple versions of this photo in this collection, where you can see in this V2 version, that there's a white scratch off section with this big white rectangle. And sure, maybe this is just an artifact of something touching the negative, but then what is all this scratching on this middle building? We can also see the same thing in this V3 version, where the building with the white band aid now has similar scratchings to the middle building from V2, as if they were trying to take it out to use for other photos. Possibly some chemical solution was added to these sections in order to extract certain features. From the Library of Congress, the Soldiers Monument in Troy, New York, this looks to be a pretty normal historical photograph. But it's actually an example of a photo that has been vanilla skied. Nothing seems wrong from a distance, right? If you zoom in on the far left of the photo here, it's blatantly clear that a mask of some kind was made around the top of the building. And if you look right here at this splatter, you can see that some sections didn't get picked up, showing that there's still parts of the building. And you can see that this is confirmed because there's a street lamp behind this car on the left, right? Just follow that and you will see those wires. What are those? Now you can see there are wires going into the trees, wires down this poles and going up and to this area that was painted over or removed chemically. Follow the line even more, and then there's this corner section of the roof, which is clearly a higher section of the building that was cut to look like just some side brick panel to the roofing. But that's a cutout, and there was a building there, which is strange because that doesn't seem to line up with the building that's now there to the left. Notice that ornamental border on the top? So is this an added building, or not even just a separate negative? Notice how it's a different quality and sharpness. Has a different mid-level to me. I mean, why are we not to believe that this entire image is a composite? 
They could have easily added these people to the foreground to make it look more alive and full. There's also these cracks on the obelisk that look added or scratched in as if they were trying to get rid of something. To me, it looks like they were hiding wires that were high in the sky, even cutting off this pole. And this goes all the way to the other side of the photo. It's not just exposure. But why do this and leave no explanation? We got a couple more from the Library of Congress, the Wayne County and Home Savings Bank, Detroit, Michigan. Now this image looks fine to me. I think most people would just think, oh, that's a historic photo. Well, on closer inspection, the sky is just paint, so it's a fake sky. There are electrical cables that were painted out, and some sections here are just floating. To the right of the image, we see several men with top hats, and some of the pants have been painted on in a very strange fashion. Also, this car right here to the right was painted over, and this guy doesn't even have a face. Some of you may think, well, you're just overanalyzing this stuff. They just wanted to clean up the photos to make it look nicer. Okay. Well, you see this white line right here? Let's follow that line, and it leads to the building. We're going up, up, and look how this is following the outline of this building. What you're looking at are the remnants of a hard mask. You can even see that they painted over at the top. It's a copy and paste building, and you have to admit, if I didn't zoom in that, most people would not have noticed. There's also another indication, is that you will see a faint white glow effect around cutouts. They're barely noticeable. Now that you can clearly see that it's a cut and a combination of multiple negatives, they don't even describe that in the description. Well, they don't even know the date. Once you see it, it's very easy to spot in other photographs. And another building from Detroit, the Wayne County building from circa 1902, the image has been vanilla skied. It's obvious towards the right because they didn't even finish it. Man, I always find these really interesting. I don't know if I necessarily believe because it's Tartaria or some kind of lost world from the past. I wonder if it's just like how we kind of do today. We have such easy access to manipulate photos now but that came from people that needed to manipulate photos. They probably ended up manipulating these photos just to make them look better. I don't know if that's necessarily the case because they are saying that they're supposed to be just straight negatives of the rendered photo, but they could have been manipulating it to make it more appealing to the masses. I'm not sure if that's the case, but I kind of think it is, but I would love to know why. Why are they covering this stuff up if it was not that case? Leave a comment down below on what you guys think because I'm always interested in this. Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And if you see this graph here, you'll see that 29% of the viewers that watch my video are subscribed to the channel. While 70% of the viewers that watch my videos are not subscribed, but keep coming back for more of my content. So to the 29% that are subscribed, thank you so much. And hey, to the 70% that are not subscribed, thank you nonetheless. I appreciate you for watching. This is your definitive video on the Moon Matrix, the Soul Trap, and Reincarnation. Here are the facts. Fact number one, there are many ancient mythological stories about two fish brothers who brought the moon to Earth. During this time, there were many catastrophic events that occurred on Earth, which would track because the gravitational pull that the moon would put on the Earth would definitely shift it and cause earthquakes, volcanoes, and many other natural disasters. These two fish brothers, the gods formerly known as Enki and Enlil, then threatened the people and said if they misbehaved too much, they would pull the moon away and great catastrophes would occur once again. Which would again track scientifically. If you remove the moon from the Earth's orbit, the Earth would go through tons of catastrophic changes. Fact number two. Two astrophysicists studied the moon, the sun, and the earth and concluded that the moon almost absolutely had to be built by an intelligent species. Fact number three, it has been proven that during the full moon, people tend to be more aggressive and there is a significant increase in emergency room visits. This is why people think the moon is a control system. It's got control system written all over it. It has a very strange origin story about fish brother god alien people that were using it to control people 
and it changes our psychology based on its phase. Does that mean we're all trapped in a moon matrix? Not exactly, but the moon has profound effects on the earth and on our psychology. So the moon doesn't create a matrix like in the movie, but it does cast a matrix upon the earth and upon us. That matrix is mostly invisible, causing natural forces like gravity and whatever strange light is coming from the moon that's colder than the rest of the surface of the earth. Now let's get into the idea of the soul trap and fact number four. The soul trap is actually just one of three belief systems that stem out of the idea that reality is in fact a dream. There are three schools or disciplines that each have their own interpretation of what the implications of that are. In the Gnostic tradition, it is believed that yes, we are trapped here. This is a sort of prison or farm. One of the main justifications by the Gnostics for this conclusion is things have to suffer in order for other things to live. For instance, the herbivores have to eat plants, but the plants are living, and how conscious are they? Are they feeling pain? And then the predators eating the herbivores, of course they're feeling pain. We can understand that. They're going through torment and suffering. The Gnostics thought because this was inherent in order for us to live, and that suffering was inherent, then this place had to ultimately be a place of suffering. But there are two other schools, the Abrahamic and the Vedic. The Abrahamic thought the opposite of what the Gnostics thought. They thought that ultimately this was a story with a happy ending. And if you lived a righteous life, you would transcend this one and go to an even greater place, an unimaginably greater place in heaven. But they also sort of believed that this place was a lower place. It wasn't all that great. Then there is the third school of thought, which is the one I tend to lean more towards. And I call it Vedic, but it's Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, the Egyptian mystery schools. And that's the idea that this is a dream in some neutral sense, that we can dream whatever we want to dream. And the reason we're here is because God felt alone, and then he spread himself out across all of existence and made little pieces of consciousness so he could play hide-and-seek with himself. I like this one the most because it empowers us the most. It doesn't damn us to a hell that we can't escape, but it also doesn't give us false hope in a heaven that might not exist. It tells us that we are the creators. We are the magicians, and we are little pieces of God, majestic, divine beings. And now reincarnation. Here are the facts, and these are a bit strange. The Buddhists believe, as explained in their Tibetan Book of the Dead, that it takes 49 days for you to traverse the bardos, the in-between world, to go from one life to the next. What's very interesting about that is the fact that 49 days after conception, the baby in the womb becomes a male or a female. And on that same day, a massive amount of DMT is released from the baby. And many people have believed for thousands of years, even modern scientists, that DMT might act as a sort of window for the soul. That is, when it's produced in large enough amounts, you can traverse between this world and the next. But what about this idea of a personal, individual reincarnation from one specific life to the next? Do I believe every person that tells me that in a past life they were a pharaoh? No, not at all. I think there's an idea of reincarnation, but I think it's more like all things that live and die reincarnate into all other things. So you might have been Shakespeare in a past life, but it was far more likely that you were like ten heads of lettuce. I think God reincarnates all the time in and out of everything. And I believe that if anyone had the truth on what exactly happens when we faithfully depart, it was people like Christ, who said we are all pieces of God, and if we want, we can individuate the soul, create the light body, and resurrect as a spiritual being. What I essentially think this means is we condense our consciousness into something that transcends our physical body. We create a sort of photonic version of our DNA, which is where I believe our consciousness and soul is stored. So what do I think about the moon matrix, the soul trap, and reincarnation as a whole? I think we need to dream bigger. I think we need to start opening our minds and hearts more and play with our imagination like when we were kids. I think we've all put ourselves into a lot of nasty corners with some bad ideologies. I think that if we all convinced ourselves of a new religion, a new spiritual cosmology, that it will become true because consciousness, language, words are the fundamental basis of our creation. And so whatever story we tell ourselves and believe is the story that eventually becomes true.
There's a lot of theories to go off of this one. Reincarnation's always interested me. I don't know if it's necessarily real. I don't know if it's a bad thing or if it can be a good thing, but it has always interested me because there's always children that talk about their past lives or adults that talk about their past lives. And that stuff's pretty fascinating, especially when they can get it very accurate. Whenever there's a full moon, let me tell you, people are crazy. It seems like that's when everyone's their most hostile, is when there's a full moon out. I do not know why. Leave a comment on your thoughts about this because I would like to know your thoughts about all of these theories, but I would also like to know, do you guys ever experience people being extra during a full moon? Craziest bits of news that you will not hear about on the news. There is officially a metal ball in the middle of the earth. Tell me if I'm insane, but I kind of remember them always saying it was like a metal ball in the middle. Or is that just me tripping? This giant pyramid in Antarctica has resurfaced in the news. Now this was a huge talking point a couple of years ago. Buzz Aldrin visited this place, which is literally in the middle of nowhere, and literally made a tweet about it saying it is evil itself. There are some rumours coming out about it, so I will keep you updated on that. Yesterday this photo emerged, which is pretty insane to be fair. A photo of the supermassive black hole at the centre of the Milky Way. In a recent study done, it says that if you get less than 7 hours sleep a night, you could die. Cool. Basically saying you are a lot more likely to develop a higher blood pressure and other disorders if you get less than 7 hours sleep a night. In Australia they are testing out glow in the dark road, so yeah, Mario Kart, Rainbow Road, here we go. Of course, more scientists and more warnings are coming out about the 8th of April. Yeah, as I'm sure most of you know, on the 8th of April there is a full eclipse in the US warning about mass death and how this event is going to be horrific, so make sure you're prepared if you're in the US, guys. But yeah, hit that follow button, I'll keep you updated on all of this, and the latest bits of news. I keep seeing that Antarctica pyramid appearing again, and I'm curious as to why. Is it, is it just people are bored and it's making its rounds again, or is there some news that I've missed out on it since recently? And as far as the sleep goes, if that's the case, then I'm probably knocking on death's door, because I know I only get like four hours of sleep, and that's been for years. Did you guys see what's happening tonight? Yeah, the Jewish sacrifice of the Red Heifer. The same sacrifice that only nine throughout history have done. And according to Jewish lore, the tenth is supposed to bring in the Messiah. For those of you who don't know what the Red Heifer is, I'll let you know. Remember, this is for entertainment purposes only. The Red Heifer is a female red cow that was offered as a sin offering. Apparently, this is supposed to be signifying the third temple being built as well. But there are theories that it has already been built. Here's the thing, though. We know that Jesus was the final Red Heifer. He died for our sins. He died to save us. So tonight, if the Jews are going to sacrifice a red heifer, because they still don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, my question to you is, who do you think that they're really sacrificing to? Because it's not Jesus. It's a different Messiah. The dark Messiah. I think that tonight they're going to try to sacrifice to the Antichrist. Now, don't get me all mixed up as an anti-Semite, because I love Israel. It will always be God's chosen land, and I will always stand with that. However, I am not stupid. I know that if you deny Christ, you deny God. And unfortunately, Israel has been corrupted through King Solomon's teachings and the Talmud and their biblical history of always turning away from God and running to false idols. I don't hate the Jews and never will. They are lost and need Jesus more than ever. So I guess we're going to see what's going to go down with these red heifers because I've been kind of interested in this and I don't know. This series just got a lot of crazy stuff happening. So hold on to your seats. This is what I mean when I say the aliens are already here. There are certain species that do look very, very human, but are not. Prime example. The Pleiadians are very, very human looking, usually very pale and also blonde hair, blue eyes. This is kind of Nordic looking. Not all Pleiadians, but a lot of them resemble this. So yeah, they are hidden in plain sight and I don't get negative energy from her or anything. I'm just giving her as an example because she's really got that classic Pleiadian face. Look at that. I mean, she's beautiful, but she's an alien. <laughs> Like, I don't, I don't know how else to say it. We are the aliens. It's many of us, not all of us, but it's many of us here with bigger missions. And this is one. I wonder 
all the time. People of power, you know, people that govern, even actors and actresses, I often wonder, are they aliens? Because some of them do have very alien-esque features, even though that's kind of kind of being a little judgmental because they're probably just regular people that just so happen to have this look to them. But it, it does make me wonder, what do you guys think? If there's anybody out there that you think that is an alien, who do you think it is? Actor, actresses, people of power, you name it. Put it in the comments down below. They just made internet that is 4.5 million times faster than what you're using right now. Researchers in the UK found a new method to transmit data. And let me just put in perspective just how much faster this new method is. The average internet speed in the UK is about 69 megabits a second. And in the US, it's about 242 megabits a second. Well, using this new method, these researchers were able to transmit data at a rate of 301 million megabits a second. With speeds like that, you could download every single game in your entire library basically instantaneously. Now, of course, SSDs and everything, they don't work that fast, but that's a whole other conversation. Now, the researchers were able to achieve this lightning fast speed by using new wavelength fans that aren't used in traditional fiber optic systems. Now, the most wild thing about this whole new discovery is that we could be getting these speeds at home right now. Because the method they use to get these speeds technically exists in existing fiber cables that you're probably getting your internet from right now. Now, when exactly we'll start seeing these lightning fast speeds for normal people is anybody's guess. But I personally can't wait for the day that I can download all of my games within milliseconds. I love extremely fast internet. I've come from an area where that we did not have any internet, no cellular service. So when I had capabilities of getting my own internet, that was game over for me because I made sure to get the best internet that I could possibly get because I like to have super fast downloads, super fast uploads. My internet is one gigabyte up and one gigabyte down and it is pretty fast, but it's pretty expensive. And I guarantee that this is going to be up there in the hundreds of dollars once it becomes consumer grade. What do you guys think about this? Are any of you interested in internet like that or do you, are you just fine with what internet you have? Me personally, I like really fast internet. As the world is waking up to what's really going on, I think it's important that all the conspiracy people start to get more bold and start to speak out about what we know. We were the ones who didn't comply. We were the ones who questioned everything back in like 2019, 2020. And we were the ones who did our research. And we know a lot about what's going on. And a lot of us know what's about to happen. I can't share a lot of stuff on my platform. My videos get yanked pretty quickly if I go too off topic. So I'm going to start referring all the people that are openly discussing these things. I want to preface this really quickly and say that if you are not privy to this information, it is very hard to digest. This information caused me to cry for months on end. But here's the truth, y'all. It is happening. It is happening to our little ones and if they have to go through it, we should know about it. I will always refer my videos back to Christ because I am a Christian and Jesus is the only thing that matters. We are walking through the book of Revelation and we are up against an evil that is incomprehensible to the average person. It is hard to take in that this exists. It is hard to take in that this, this is happening. And it's just overall just hard to wrap your brain around. Go type her name into TikTok. She talks openly about all of this stuff. She is an ex-Satanist. She was actually born into it. She has the symbol on her birth certificate. She got out. She is a follower of Christ now, and she wants to share what's going on. She shares a lot about end times. She shares a lot about the depopulation agenda. She talks openly about the one world government, all of that stuff. She also talks about this stuff. And this is where we get into it. This is where we hit the evil. This is where we hit the hard hitting stuff that people don't want to accept. But again, it's important that people know. She even discusses the fact that they take the ashes and they will put S-P-E-L-L-S -L -L -S on them and then they sell them to the food companies and guess what the food companies do with them. This is an evil that is beyond what we can comprehend. This is an evil that we all need to be aware of. And when I say that we need to put on the armor of God and we need to fight, this is what I'm talking about. I really hope we're not eating people whenever we eat meat from outside of our own farming land and things like that because that's even if that's something we did in the past I feel like that's something that we should not be going back to at any point in our lives even though I'm pretty sure there's tribes out there in the world that do eat 
human meat still. Definitely not for me if I can help it because that just sounds disgusting and not okay. How about any of you? Do any of you really think that they're out there recirculating human remains as food product? Because if that's the case, we're going to have to make sure we start eating straight from our own land. Do not trust anyone, even your parents. This young girl is Molly. Now, Molly grew up in an extremely strict home. Single mother, the father left or passed away, she doesn't even know. From a young age, Molly was never allowed technology. She didn't even go to school. She was homeschooled. She was like the strictest of strict. Like she can do anything. To the point where she had never even seen the outside world. She wasn't even allowed outside of her house. But this is how she was brought up. She didn't think anything different of it. She had a few friends that she did online lessons with and had met through, you know, online things. But basically all of her time was spent inside the house learning with her mum on the computer or playing in the garden with her mum and her dog. Now when Molly got to about 12 years old, stuff started to get a bit strange. The young girl then realised that a lot of people were playing outside. She used to say to her mum, they're playing out on the street, how come they're allowed out there? Her mum said, yes, but we're different. We don't want to be like that. But Molly said, I do. I want to be out there with these sort of people, playing with them and making friends. Molly's mum quickly snapped back and said, no. She carried on just like normal, but now had this inkling in her mind, which was, what is going on? Because something isn't right with this family here. Now, every day after online school, her mum would turn off the computer and have strict instructions that Molly do not turn it on, and there would be severe punishments if she did. Now, up until this point, she'd always obeyed the rules, but today that changes. So, Molly's mum's phone was actually next to the computer this day after they finished with the online school. The SIM card was taken out of the phone for whatever reason, but Molly slipped it back in and went on her mum's phone while she was out of the room. She had a quick swipe through the phone and found things like Instagram and didn't know what social media was, so had a look on it and accidentally posted a photo of herself. She carried on swiping through until she heard footsteps of her mum coming closer to her. She worked as quickly as she could to try and take the SIM card out again and put the phone back in the exact position that it was in. Her mum came in and said, Molly, what are you doing? She said nothing, just, just finishing up some, you know, homework and that. Molly went to bed that night, just like every other night, but woke up at about 4 a.m. And this is where things change. She woke up bright and early to her mum grabbing her and shaking her to say, wake up, Molly, wake up, we need to go. She thought, what's going on? Why do we need to go anywhere? Like, it's just a normal day. Her mum picked her up and ran as fast as she could down the stairs and into the car, chucking Molly in the passenger seat. Molly was extremely confused. She'd never even been out the front of the house before, let alone in a flipping car. So they started driving. Of course, Molly was extremely confused, wondering what was happening, pressing the buttons in the car, seeing what did what. The mum was absolutely frantic, driving as quickly as she possibly possibly could, making sure that the radio wasn't going on, saying, Molly, stop, don't press anything, just stay calm, stay calm. Molly was calm. It was her mum that wasn't. They carried on driving for about half an hour until Molly then eventually managed to turn up the radio volume. Her mum quickly turned it down again. She turned it up. She turned it down again, and she turned it up. She kept her hand on it as it was up, and it was the radio reading the news. 12-year-old girl Maisie Daniels, who was kidnapped 10 years ago, is on the run in a red Suzuki. Molly was confused. She thought, oh, who's that? And then realised they were in a red Suzuki. All the cars that were speeding by were now looking in the window of this car and looking at the number plate to see if it matched the description of what the police report said. And sure enough, it did. Molly, or Maisie, was now extremely frantic, wondering what the hell is going on until they did get pulled over in a lay-by by police and her mum, this woman, was arrested. Turns out this woman kidnapped this young girl 10 years ago and of course wasn't even her actual mum. Maisie, the young girl, was then placed in foster care because her actual parents didn't want to see her. Dang, if this is a real story, that's pretty crazy, and I wonder how often does that really happen? And why would the parents not want to see the kid after 10 years missing? Like, I, I don't make no sense either. Like, was it a sell-off, or what was it? Because that's kind of messed up. But I'm sure this stuff happens a lot, and we're just completely unaware of it, including the people that are kidnapped. So, you know that thing that happened four years ago that made us, like, obligated to stay into our houses and go slower, take our time, because literally the world almost stopped working for a second. This was to introduce the concept of going back to being a human being, not a human doing. This was to introduce the concept to people that they don't want to work as much, they don't want to go as fast, and they don't want to have to do the commute, and then the nine to five, and then taking care of all the to-do lists and all the shit. We are operating in a simulation. We have been for a long fucking time. You may or may not believe me, but there is a huge consciousness vibrational shift on the planet. I literally talk about only this in my videos. 
videos. If you are currently going through your awakening or you've had it already and you don't really know where to throw yourself, I did write an ebook called How to Not Lose Your Shit After Unplugging from the Matrix, which I feel like should be like the introduction guide to an awakening, but that's, you know, just me. Everything about life has been so different since what happened four years ago. I'm not gonna say the word because I don't want whatever. It made people realize that they wanna spend more time with their family. They don't wanna work for someone else and they have to work from home. Oh my God, I love working from home. I truly believe that where we are going with this huge consciousness shift is that the old system completely falls away. So working for corporations, working and slaving yourself for money because you can barely afford to pay your bills. I do not believe that that is what reality is going to be like after this shift. The point of this shift is to free mankind from enslavement energetic and spiritual enslavement. They've been harvesting our energy because we have to pay our bills, right? So we get these jobs and we're sold the concept that if we exchange our time for money, that's how we can make rent, right? But you have people out here who literally make money while they take a shit and everything is paid for and even more. The concept that you must exchange your time for money is an enslavement system because you will never have enough time to make as much money as you'd like. They sell you the concept that you have to go to school, you have to get good grades, you have to get a good diploma, a good job, even if you don't like it, sell your soul away, you have nothing divine and special about you. Conform, fit in the system, because if you don't fit in the system, you're not gonna make it. They don't want you to know how fucking powerful you are, and this is what it's about, freeing that. The truth is coming out, I don't know, I'm getting chills. So the event that happened four years ago was the beginning of the end. And it is so fucking exciting because I know we're going to see changes. I get a lot of comments of people saying like, yeah, conspiracy theorists are always saying like, yeah, when, it, soon, soon, right? I don't give a shit how long it takes because it's worth the wait, in my opinion, but you know, that's just me. I know a lot of people are impatient. I know a lot of you guys know about the dark truths of the world and you're just waiting for it to change and you're hanging on by a thread. I want to offer you my compassion because I know this is not easy and I would like to tell you hang in there because I do not think that this is going to last for much longer. I unfortunately do not have an exact date for you as to when this is all gonna like start tumbling down and we can physically see it. But these are such exciting times. I know you can feel it. I definitely do think the lockdown made people realize, hey, I don't really like working at work. I can work from home. It's a little bit more freeing. Now, me personally, I worked at my physical job even during lockdown, but I do know a lot of people that did get to work from home and they still work from home to this very day. And there's nothing wrong with that, I don't think, but that's not the case for everybody, not people working in the restaurant industry or people working at gas stations, things like that. There, There's a requirement to have certain people at certain jobs until it becomes so automated by either robots or a self-made system. But for the most part, there's still a lot of jobs that really require you to be on deck. And as far as it all being over soon, I don't know. I really don't think it is. I think that we might have changes in the world now that adapt to our ways of working. But the physical outside of our home realm is still going to be there and it's still going to require some sort of work. At least that's what I think. Let me know in the comments on your beliefs. All right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here. For my wife's birthday the other day, I want to say thank you to all the birthday wishes. She really appreciated that. As always, if you were interested in any of the clips that we played, links are in the description down below. So with that being said, have a good day.